Welcome to Trends with Benefits, a podcast by Van Eck with a forward-looking perspective. We explore new ways of thinking about the markets, investing, work, and life. Here's your host, Ed Lopez. Welcome to another episode of Trends with Benefits. Today, I'll be speaking with Lori Weyburn, co-founder and president of Pacific Forest Trust. Pacific Forest Trust is an accredited nonprofit conservation land trust and policy think tank that advances forest conservation and stewardship solutions. Ms. Weyburn is an accomplished forest and conservation innovator who advises policymakers at all levels. And as a preeminent authority on climate and ecosystem benefits of forests, she leads efforts enacting climate change policies that unite conservation and sustainable management with market-based approaches. I could keep going, but I would rather have her tell you about her story. Lori, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Is it fair to say that environmental conversation is your life's work? It's a passion? It is. It is. It's certainly a motivating force for me. And uh, I think for anybody who has children or wants to have children or enjoys children, um, it should be a motivating force for them too. How so or why? I think we have in the past 100 years so fundamentally shifted our, uh, shall we say, balance of power between the human impact and our natural context that we are at a breaking point for many natural systems that support us. Uh, So the challenge for us, if we want our children and grandchildren to have a livable climate and a beautiful world should drive us to really care about ensuring that that we are changing our direction and conservation or stewardship is a key part of that. Environmental conservation and stewardship, from what I've read, has been a part of your life from a very early age. Can you talk a little bit about that and your and its role in your life growing up? Well, certainly I've been uh, blessed to grow up in a, uh, an environment that was extraordinarily inspiring. I grew up going to national parks and hiking in wilderness areas and having an opportunity to see the extraordinary variety and beauty of life that's on this planet. But at the same time, I've also seen the change in condition of our planet and uh, in particular, the change in how much of our, what we would call our natural world remains. People are of course a part of nature. Even the way that you were posing the question, environmental conservation implies that it's not about us, it's about the environment. But of course the environment is where we live. It's the forest that we can walk in and the trees on our city streets. So I think that one piece of this transformation that we are in is recognizing that it's not about nature on the one side and people on the other. It's about how we live together. That's a wonderful point. You, you talked about the change that you've seen over, the, over your career. Is that, is that change for good or for worse that you've seen? Uh, well, change is. I'm not sure that change always has a value associated with it because sometimes something that's bad can drive something that's good and the two can't really exist without each other. What I'm seeing today is a significantly growing acknowledgement that climate change is exacerbating a whole series of crises for us. And you're seeing a response to that across, for example, the investment world You're seeing a response to that often very charged in the political world. And that's making people think and change behavior. And that's really good. On the other hand, the impacts of these crises, be they floods, be they fires, be they famines, be they water shortages, that's not so good. Extraordinary species loss that we're going through, the collapse in our biological diversity, that's not good. Do you think that the, that's born out of a tension between economic progression and modernization and the environment itself or the environment outside of human beings itself? You're actually pointing to a driving uh, force for me 
which is that those two things have often been seen in opposition. Either you can serve or you make money. And I think the critical path, the change is to do both. I have great faith in human ingenuity and I think we can certainly change how we manage our resource development, our production of goods and services so that that does not need to be in opposition. And I think there are very good examples of that that are emerging. Can we talk a little bit about your background? And we'll come back and, and talk about what you're currently doing with uh, the Pacific Forest Trust. But just to get an understanding of kind of how much you've been involved in environmental conservatism, uh, conservation, I should say. For instance, your, your, your parents were fairly well-renowned uh, conservationists. And it, did they really influence your work today? I am like any other human being. My parents definitely influenced me. Um, And I had mentioned earlier that I had the uh, pleasure of growing up walking in our national parks and our wilderness areas, exploring all kinds of wild spaces in the United States. Um, And that definitely gave me a love of nature. But at the same time, they were extraordinarily effective in a time, in a very different time. The world seemed a lot bigger. The kind of thinking about how conservation impacted the world was to set beautiful places aside. I went on to work in the United Nations Environment Program and in the Ecological Sciences Program of the United Nations, overseas in third world countries, developing economies. And that kind of a model was not an affordable or a successful model because people live much closer to the earth there. They are much more evidently part of nature, shaping nature, even as we are in this country, but we don't think about it that way. The driving forces in the programs that I was part of were, how do you help emerging economies develop in a sustainable way? That's a very different paradigm than, this is a beautiful place, let me set aside a park where people will go for vacation and take beautiful pictures and see animals. That's a very uh, Western notion of of conservation. That early experience working overseas really changed my thinking about how we can evolve our understanding of nature conservation to be part of how people live. Can you talk a little bit about the Pacific Forest Trust and and what you are doing today and perhaps the work that you're doing with with policymakers? So the Pacific Forest Trust is an organization that I co-founded with Connie Best, really focusing in on how we can reweave our forest landscape across public and private ownerships. Uh, We founded this organization at a time when attention was utterly focused on saving the last remaining bits of old growth forest on public lands. And while that's extremely important, it's very much out of the school of let's save this beautiful small space and didn't really recognize the kind of ecological context of that old growth. And it ignored the fact that there's really a crisis in the United States in terms of private forest land, that we were losing twice as much acreage of private forest land to development as farmland every year. And really nobody knew about it. Forests are an invaluable part of our lives, but they're also quite invisible to many people. So what we wanted to do in founding the Pacific Forest Trust was a kind of threefold mission. One was to understand the drivers behind forest loss. Two was with that understanding, kind of counter them so that we found ways to reward landowners to keep their forest lands intact and to manage them well. And three was to really kind of develop a new approach to managing forests as forests and not simply as sources of fiber or timber products. Because forests are an amazing system. They're not just a row of trees. If you will, that old adage of seeing the forest for the trees is so much more profound than most people think because forests are where our water comes from. They stabilize our climate. They are sources of medicine and food and homes for fish and wildlife. So we wanted to help bring value to forests in addition to their value as sources of fiber or timber. There was a a stat I saw in a, I think from an article from 2010 that talked about uh, forests that covers one third, forest covers one third of the U.S., 
but two thirds of it is in private hands. Is that still about right? That's about right. It's a little bit less in private hands now down to 62% as opposed to 66%. But yes, the vast majority of forests in the United States are privately owned. And are there many regulations for use of forests? Uh, forest regulation is handled really at the state level. So it's very variable across the country. Some states like California have a fairly uh, well-developed regulatory context. Other states like Alabama do not. And so part of your, your current role now is to, to work with uh, regulators uh, or policymakers at various, at various levels, state, national, I guess even international. Um, can you talk a little bit about some current work that you're doing in that regard? Well, most people look at the regulatory framework from the point of view of stopping bad things. We want clean water. We want to stop pollution in the water. Uh, we want clean air. We want to stop bad air. Uh, we look at the policy framework and say, how can this encourage good things? And that's because regulations inevitably set a floor. And our focus was to help people, shall we say, reach for the sky. Um, and encourage them to do that. So our policy work by and large is focused on developing new markets for forest services. So paying people to manage forests for the things that we really need in addition to good wood. Uh, because currently the regulatory environment is focused on protecting public benefits like that clean water and clean air by saying what you won't do. And that's that regulatory floor. So what we've focused on is developing new policies, and from that comes a regulatory framework, that reward landowners when they do manage for what the public really needs and wants, those public benefits. Uh, so one of the key things that we have done is incorporate the role of forests in climate change. So rewarding landowners for keeping their forests as forests, because forests play a very big role in the carbon dioxide cycle. Uh, another one we have focused on is incorporating forests into water systems so that they, landowners can be paid for upkeep and maintenance of forests, just like we pay for upkeep and maintenance of pipes. Another area that we have focused on is how to reward landowners who manage for protecting and restoring habitat for vulnerable species. There are two federal regulations that impact forest landowners across the country. One is the Endangered Species Act and the other is the Clean Water Act. So those are regulatory levers at the federal level across state. Our work at the federal level has been more on seeking to enhance the amount of funding that is available to landowners for conservation and for restoration work. So is that the innovation that Pacific Forest Trust brings in terms of bringing that, that market economy uh, outlet for, for landowners? That is exactly one example. Another example is uh, with regard to, for example, managing habitat for endangered species. Under the Endangered Species Act, um, there's something called jeopardy. If you, if you have that species on your property, and what you are doing puts that species in jeopardy, then you can't do that anymore. That is the kind of classic regulatory stop. You gotta recognize that the Endangered Species Act doesn't kick in until you have only a thousand members of that species left. Think of it, there are only a thousand people left. Now you're protected under the Endangered Species Act. It's, it's the very far end of the spectrum tool but it's been something that many people have been extremely concerned about being too tough. And we looked at this and said, well, how could we encourage landowners actually to restore the habitat that endangered species need? So we have been able to use conservation easements, which are a fundamental tool that underpin what we do to help landowners get regulatory relief or shall we say operational certainty when they do a conservation easement that either protects habitat for endangered species or restores and protects habitat for endangered species, that they can continue doing the right thing, that they're not gonna get stopped for that when that species occupies their property. 
So that's another way of, uh, that we've operated. And I think the kind of fundamental innovation that we have brought to the field of conservation, it's been emulated pretty widely now. The focus is on conserving managed land, land that continues to be economically productive. And in addition, we're really happy when our landowners do well and make more money because then it's a competitive advantage in the marketplace, as opposed to saying, we protected this by locking it up. This is changing that paradigm to say, we're gonna protect this because it is in your enlightened financial self-interest to do so. And it's a very active form of protection. It's not a put the wall up form of protection. That's great. Can we talk about one specific example that's close to the Van Eck heart here? And, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the Van Eck forest and uh, the, the role that it has or the role that you have as, uh, I guess, overseeing that forest. Well, it's a wonderful uh, synergy. I knew Fred Van Eck and Fred Van Eck embodied this notion that if you invest in hard assets and something that lasts for the long term, A, that's a really good investment strategy. B, it's something that can be applied in a lot of different sectors. So in meeting him, he was interested in this kind of intersection of economic and ecological thrival, if you will, well-being. What's that sweet spot between the two? Forests have always been an attractive long-term investment vehicle, so they kind of fall in that hard asset category. So he wanted to explore this notion of how could you manage for that sweet spot where you were sustaining the forest ecologically and you were having a sustainable economic output. And uh, so we did, we agreed to work together. We have two forests that are the Van Eck forests. One is in California and one is in Oregon highly productive forest land, both in the classic sense of timber, and they're highly productive ecologically as well. We have conservation easements on these properties that guide that management for the long term. They set what management is to achieve over time, as opposed to saying what you're not going to do really. With that, we're focusing that timber harvest on ways that will restore the full ecological function of those forests. Uh, That is particularly unusual in the context of the Oregon forests, which were very young plantations when we took over their management. They were managed for pulp and paper production, which is neither economically the most productive and certainly not ecologically the most productive. They are wonderful forests from the point of view of demonstrating new approaches, From a financial perspective, it provides supplementary, complementary income. Uh, It is also the site where we did the very first safe harbor agreement under the Endangered Species Act based on the conservation easement, which is on the property. So it has operational certainty and it has supplemental income. At the same time, we harvest over a million board foot of timber every year off of that property. So... Are you actively seeking other forest owners in in the Pacific to help them with with the management of their properties? Yeah, we are. We do that regularly. We've we've conserved about 285, 290,000 acres. We have conservation easements on 108,000 or so, and then we manage directly about 14,000 acres. So in any of those areas of either working with landowners on conservation easements, which guide management, or in terms of actually managing their lands for them or co-managing with them, we do that as well. I should mention that conservation easements in and of themselves are a really significant source of financial return for landowners. The type that we do bring landowners back roughly half the value of their entire property when that easement is acquired while they still keep the land in management. Can you talk about that? I mean, what, what exactly is that? Is that paying landowners to basically set aside a portion of their, their forest? Is that right? To, to put towards this management approach? So conservation easements um, are a set of restrictions on a property deed, and they're embodied in a property deed at the same time. So when you buy a piece of property, when you own a piece of property, you own a series of rights of things to do with that property, to harvest the timber, to subdivide, to build, to graze, to have 
vineyards, whatever it is. And a conservation easement takes all or a portion of that right and limits what you will do with it. So you can limit the subdivision, you can limit the development, you can limit the harvest at any given time. And that is an appraisable value. So if your property is worth $1,000 unencumbered by a conservation easement, and that is made up of say $300 of development value and $700 of timber liquidation value, that's you know right now what you could harvest. And you say, I really don't wanna develop this and I'm not interested in liquidating my timber right now. I'm interested in taking you know, 50% of it on a regular basis. Well, you have $350 worth of value right there. So you're paid for that. And you can be paid either dollar for dollar with a check or you can donate a portion of that. It is the only partial interest gift that is recognized in the tax code as being fully deductible, or you can donate all of it. So it's a very flexible uh, financial planning tool, if you will, for people who own forest land. And if they have capital gains that they want to balance off, they may wish to donate a portion of the easement. If instead they want cash flow, they should sell it all. I'm curious what you think about the increasing popularity of ESG investing in the marketplace. Have you followed that at all? I think it's a very positive evolution. You know, just like you want to know what you're eating, what's gone into it, <laughs> um, because you want to be sure that it's good for you. Um, it's good to know what you're investing in. And the environmental, social, and governance movement, if you will, is one which I think helps drive markets to do good. If we look at where we are uh, as a world writ large, uh, with so many crises that we are addressing, harnessing the power of markets to do good, and the energy of people and the drive to generate a strong economy, it's a terrific thing to do. It's, it's applying the principles of jujitsu, right? One of the challenges of regulation is it's always about no. Jiu-Jitsu says, hey, instead of trying to be the brick wall that stops something, let's take that energy and turn it the direction we want. Anybody who's had children, there's a role for no. There's also a great role for yes. And I think that's the, that's the energy that we seek to harness. That's awesome. So with, um, with the Biden administration coming in, what do you hope to see from the administration in 2021? I think what would be extremely powerful would be to harness our inherent competitive advantage of land in addressing the climate crisis. That is neither Republican nor Democratic. That is recognizing that we have the most productive forest land in these temperate forests that can be managed in the near term to make the difference in whether or not we are successful in addressing climate change or not. I would hope that an incoming administration was able to catalyze a really transformative approach to how we manage land. And whether it's in our agricultural lands or in forestry through, shall we say, regenerative natural forest management, that's an enormous opportunity. And it extends to what can be done in terms of global trade as well. But in terms of how we can harness, shall we say, the disaster that climate change poses on a regular everyday basis, use this as an opportunity to catalyze a change in how we manage our forests and our other lands, that will put so many more people back to work. It will drive cleaner, more sustainable water supplies. It will give us a fighting chance under climate change. Where did the jobs come from in, in that kind of scenario? What are people doing extra or what extra kind of work is needed and that can be funded? Starting from the ground up, if you will, we do need to be restoring more uh, natural structures to our forest, which means doing more thinning. We do need to be planting new species back into our forests that are currently missing in very simplified forests that are susceptible to climate change. We need to be working to restore our stream channels. One of the things that people might not recognize, Ed, is that a well-managed forest can reduce the intensity of a flood by up to 40%. That makes a really big difference. 
So that's a lot of people going to work uh, doing thinning, prescribed fire, stream restoration, meadow restoration. That is a lot more people at work more regularly because you're, it's kind of like instead of doing deferred maintenance every 20 years, you have people out in the forest every year and they're doing a real variety of jobs. So it's, it's, uh, it's more creative in some senses, but it's also many other aspects of jobs. And if you're looking to data around this, the single most effective job creator investment is in forest conservation. There are more jobs per dollar in forest conservation than any other job type that you, know, you might be looking at as a federally supported program. So as we talk about infrastructure in the U.S. and upgrading the infrastructure, we need to upgrade our environmental infrastructure. Absolutely. Well said. Absolutely well said. And I would hope that in, a, in an infrastructure package, that that was a significant area of investment. Um, and in the uh, HR2, which was a big infrastructure bill pushed out of the House this year, that element was there. So I would certainly hope that in a next iteration, it both remains and grows as an investment area. I think also, and this is not a political issue, but that is one where recognizing the role that rural areas, rural communities, rural landowners play in these absolutely critical infrastructure issues and uh, directing investment there as part of any investment around climate is really critical. Absolutely need to do everything we can in terms of you know the kind of classic energy and building and transportation green jobs, but the truly green jobs are also in that natural infrastructure and what it can do for us. What's one long-term trend you see playing out over the next year or several years? It can be about anything that we've talked about. It can be about anything that we haven't talked about, just maybe something that's top of mind for you. Well, I think you actually have, have touched on it. It really is the awareness of investors and people writ large that where they put their money matters. If you take the challenges that we're facing from the climate crisis and you put those two things together, I think that trend is only going to increase because we're seeing so-called natural disasters every day now, virtually every week, whether it's a hurricane or an ice storm or fires or pest outbreaks, or it's, it's everywhere. And if you look at the drivers of unrest in the Middle East and of war in the Middle East over water, and frankly, it's one of the biggest drivers for the contest uh, over the Himalaya, because that's where the glaciers that deliver water to both China and India are. And as those glaciers recede, which they are doing, water shortages are definitely on long-term planners' minds. So whether it is global or whether it is at home, we're going to be seeing more and more of this. So that trend and the ability of markets to influence how we address that trend, I think will only increase. So we do a, a segment called Trender Fad. It's kind of a, a rapid fire segment where I'll, I mention a few different concepts and huh. get your quick take on it. Do you want to try okay. it? Connected Home Fitness, Trender Fad. The markets yesterday... They collapsed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking somebody who's, uh, you know, working in the environment, you might say, everybody just get off your Peloton and just go for a walk in the forest. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, a better response to that is, is uh, the COVID crisis has driven a lot of people outside as well. Um, and one of the things you, you may know is that being in forests enhances your immune system. It also reduces your cortisol production. So when you go outside for that run and you're pumping up endorphins, why not enhance your immune and reduce your stress by doing it in a forest? Electric vehicles, a trend or fad? Absolutely. I own two. Oh, all right. <laughs> and I think you mentioned this one already. Regenerative agriculture, trend or fad? Good thing. Definitely a good thing. That'll increase. Plant-based meat substitutes, Beyond Meat, trend or fad? Yes, I think it's going to continue. This is great. Lori, thank you so much for your time. I, I appreciate your, your insights. Is there a way for people to follow you? Are you on Twitter, LinkedIn? 
you want them to go to your website? Absolutely go to our website, uh, sign up for our, our newsletter at pacificforest.org. And uh, I do not have a Twitter account. I realize that I am behind the times, but it's because it takes time. And I just don't always have that. Uh, I am on LinkedIn, but the easiest way to follow our work is to sign up on our website at www.pacificforest.org. Fantastic. Thank you again. I appreciate your time. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Take care. And thanks for tuning in to another episode of Trends with Benefits.